Well, it's great to see you again, Michael. Uh, and I'm glad that we're able to connect from Armenia to California, right? That's where you're at, correct? This is, uh, this is Pasadena. If you can see any of this behind me, it's, that's Colorado Boulevard right there. So. Nice. A beautiful day there. It's nighttime where I'm at. It's great to see you, Mike. And um, today I, we're going to talk about uh, something that's uh, really your expertise and we're going to be talking about Sohomon Tehlerian, which Solomon uh, is the guy's name, a really uh, famous Armenian in some people's eyes and very infamous in other people's eyes. Uh, and uh, before we get into this, I do want people, if you're watching this, you guys need to get to know Michael Gavlak and his channels. He has uh, the Sovereign Artsakh uh, YouTube channel will be in the description in Tales of Truth. And he has been bringing light to the war that's raging here, the attack on the Republic of Artsakh and on Armenia proper. And so you're gonna learn a lot of information. So please watch his videos. But let's, uh, I wanna say, let's get on to uh, this topic, uh, Michael. And before I ask you a question, I just, uh, we were talking earlier and you, you know, said, well, how did you know about this guy? Well, let me, let me tell you. So I was uh, living, I moved to Istanbul, Turkey in the year 2002 with my wife. And I forgot when it was. Um, I for, first, just to be honest, I was pretty ignorant guy. I mean, I grew up in Arkansas. There is a reputation that we're barefoot, we're rednecks, all those things. I mean, I've been shooting guns my whole life. There's some, some truth to that. But I, I, God called me to Turkey and I went there so I could share the gospel. And I got an education on a lot of things. And one was the Armenian Genocide. And I remember going to the Harbiye Askeri uh, Museum. It's the, uh, the uh, military museum in an area called Harbiye. And it's a huge military museum. And I remember going into this one room in the museum. And they have this uh, uh, old car. It looks like a Model T. I don't know. It's this old car. And it has bullet holes in, in the windows. And this whole room is dedicated to the Armenian terrorist. And they said, this is the car where something, a, a chef caught Pasha was murdered by these Armenian assassins. And then there they talk about this guy, Solomon Talerian, and talked about their, uh, their operation Nemesis and uh, how they targeted people that were uh, they don't say the Armenian genocide because the Turks deny it, but they say these are Armenian terrorists. So that was my first introduction that the Turks don't really like these guys uh, because of what they did. And then they have the museum basically trying to condemn this. So can you tell us a little bit about who, who is this uh, Solomon and, and what did he do? Well, that is fascinating that that was your first introduction yeah. to who he was, because I've been in that museum as well last summer. Yeah. And there's yeah. another room, actually, there's another room in that museum that is uh, completely dedicated to a man named Talat Pasha, yeah. former uh, Grand Vizier. Um, and at one time during the genocide, he was the minister of the interior, which essentially he's in control of the entire populace in the land, right? That's how he could, he's known as the architect of the genocide. And I know most of you uh, watching this, well, maybe not most of you, but a lot of you watching this understand that that Talat was the architect of the Armenian genocide. He's the one that signed the orders. He, this is an interesting note um, because every war, and we, I think we mentioned this last in our last uh, conversation, was propaganda is how wars begin and how they end. And in, in the World War I, uh, before World War I, Talat, before he rose to power, he was a telegraph operator. He came up mm. through the telegraph office, and that's how he was able to commit this genocide. He would, yeah. he would send telegraphs to the far reaches of the empire and say, do it, do it now. And, mm. and they would follow orders. He could lie. He, you, you get a telegraph, he could tell you anything, and you, you just have to believe it. And um, so... That's, a, that's kind of an aside. So in that room, there's a room dedicated to Talat at the military. Here, let me give his picture so people can see, if you can see it on there, it's I got the glare. There it is, see. yeah. Yeah, that's yep, there the you go. Yep, there you um, go. And so in that room, and but you know, by the time I walked in that room, it, I had been researching this for two years. I walked in that mm -hmm. room and what I saw, there's a bloody shirt, the shirt he was wearing, yeah. he was a sad 
and and there were pictures uh, everywhere. And in it's one, it's not a big room, but it's just dedicated to Talat. And the pictures on the walls that I saw there, every one of them were of uh, pictures that I had already seen of massacred Armenians. But in the descriptions in that room, they were massacred Turks. So they right. literally propaganda that room. I walked like most of the museum is yep. just history, right? It's just like yeah, this right. is the history of the Ottomans and the and you know taking over Istanbul. You know, it's a great museum for that in that regard. Mm -hmm. But I walk into that room and every word in there, I look around is like this. You could feel the oppression in that yeah. one room. It was different than the other rooms. It was this is propaganda. This is a lie. Yeah. This is a little uh, uh, um, an altar to this evil. You know, it'd be like walking into a room dedicated to Adolf Hitler, right? And it's all live. So um, now, who is Solomon Tuleri? For those, yeah. um, and I refer to him as Solomon because yeah. um, we in America tend to transliterate things, but his real name was Solomon, so I call him Solomon. Right. Um, he was a young Armenian kid, uh, lived in the Ottoman Empire, and you could say he was a Turkish Armenian, right? right? Because the, you know, it's a Turk it, as, as far as a nationality. He wasn't ethnically Turkish, but um, people, gosh, I won't go into this history, but uh, there are a lot of people who refer to themselves as Turks that are not, if you did a DNA analysis, there are all these different um, uh, ethnicities because when Ataturk rose, you know, he did a census and people were like, well, I'm just going to say I'm Turkish because I won't, you know, there, it's like, it's like racism, you know, class hierarchy. And if you identify as Turk, then you, you're in the, the majority or whatever. So that aside. Well, can, can I want to say something just relevant to that. Today, you, it's, it's really hard to find an actual Turk in Turkey. I mean, I mean if, if you're Turkic, you're, you're going to look like you're from Asia, coming from southwestern China, the Uyghur people. Mm -hmm. and, and so today they kind of have this more of a Western look because of the reasons you say they're all mixed. Right. But that's another. Story. It's like calling yourself an American, right. Right? right? I'm an American. Well, your ethnic, your ethnicity may be different than your nationality. So Turkish, that's right. there are ethnic Turks, but the majority uh, are just nationalist yes. Turks. And yes. so, so Sogomon Talirian, I would, I could say, using that description, is a Turk, right? He's a young kid that grew up in what is modern day Turkey, but he's an Armenian, and mm -hmm. an Armenian Turk, the hyphenations, you know, yeah. Armenian Turk. Yeah. And he survived while well, his family was massacred. He actually escaped. Well, he was sent out of the of the empire to where his father was doing business in what at the time was Yugoslavia, um, mm -hmm. modern day Serbia. And it's like you think about people that send their relatives to America to make money and send it home. Right. Because their home environments, not, you know, there's not a lot of work or maybe they're oppressed and they. And that was the case. The Armenians were oppressed uh, the whole time or for centuries even. And so all the males in Sogomo's family were sent out. They left and they would send money home and they would visit every now and then. So it was his turn. He was the youngest of four boys. I'm going into a lot of detail here, but let's just say he was, he was the youngest of four boys and he was the last one to leave. His mother was the most important person in his life and she sent him away. And then a year later, uh, World War I breaks out. And, mm. and so he was basically on the outside looking in, how could, because the Ottomans allied with Germany and uh, the Russians, where there's a huge Armenian population, were mm. opposed to the Ottoman Empire. This is, it's the war front that people don't pay attention to from World War I. So long story short, he joined the Armenian volunteers in the Russian uh, military and fought all the way back to his homeland, the Russian pushed all the way back to his hometown and everyone was gone. Mm -hmm. He had 80 family members, women and children who had been massacred and all the males, except for one brother survived because they were in Yugoslavia. He had one brother who had come home and, and suffered uh, during the genocide. So here's a kid who just wanted to see his mom again. He just wanted to get back to his mother. He was, you know, you call him a mama's boy. And he mm. just saw the massacres. He saw the bodies, freshly killed bodies. 
everybody in the military, as they would take over towns, as the Ottomans would retreat, they'd see these massacred women and children, just everybody in town massacred in the wake of the, of the Turkish retreat. So what he ended up doing, because there was the Bolshevik revolution and the Russians pulled out and abandoned the Armenians. And so they had to pull back and, and that's when he witnessed the actual attacks as the Turks mm. advanced on the retreating caravans. And he just mm. saw people cut down in front of him. It's this horror, horror, his whole culture being exterminated right before his eyes. He gets back to Etchmiadzi and becomes a gatherer of orphans. He's appointed. So, so let me just say this for people. Etchmiadzi is located in the country of Armenia. It's kind of like the Vatican for the apostolic Armenian Christians. It's like their, their center, a religious center. And it, just so people know. Okay, go ahead. And it's the, the first Christian cathedral. Like, that's yes. And it's the first that's correct. Christian cathedral ever built and it's still standing. It's like, yeah. it's like 1500 years old or something. Um, so he, he retreats, the, the, the Armenian volunteers retreat and they're disbanded. They just lost their homeland. They were marching forward and advancing, thinking this is it. Armenia is going to be free and independent finally. Yet this huge Russian army that abandons them because of the Bolshevik revolution back home. So all of these Armenians are, are distraught and dismayed. And the only thing he can think to do is rescue the orphans that are that. And these are like they're like feral children. They've just watched everyone they care about be massacred in front of their eyes. And they run for their lives and they avoid adults, they avoid contact and they scavenge and they're just these, these street rats. And he sets about rescuing them and he gets appointed as the, the, the chief or the head orphan gatherer. And so he starts interviewing these kids. There's a newspaper guy that he teams up with and they interview every one of them. And so he's oh. watching in his mind the horrors of the genocide, like, and, and, Every one of them, he hopes to get a sign of his family. Where are you from? Give me all the names, everybody you know, what you know happened. And, and he passes out from trauma and has a vision of killing Talat. Mm, wow. So, I mean, it's like the angel of the Lord puts this on his shoulder. Like he's doing the most righteous thing you could possibly do the women and the children, the orphans, those who have been massacred. And he's, yeah. he, it's, it's his people. You know, we all have families, you know, we have parents and siblings and, and wives and children. And, and you also, he had a whole culture, you know, it's like yeah. Armenian yeah. culture is very distinct and it was now yeah. gone forever. Like that's a successful genocide. Like it is wiped out. And so he passes out in the middle of one of the interviews with one of these orphans and has this vision, this vivid mm. vision of killing Talat. And it's like, he de describes it in his memoir. So he wakes mm. up, he wakes up mm. and it's literally like, he is consumed by this idea. And this is in uh, uh, 1917 or 1916, actually, right after the genocide. Wow. So for the next six years, it's, it's on his mind. And I'll fast yeah. forward to, he gets connected yeah. with a, a covert operation. And mm -hmm. I like to compare it to, you might call it like SEAL Team 6. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, there's, after the war, the architects of the genocide, all the perpetrators escaped. They, were, right. sentenced, they were sentenced to death in the, in the Ottoman Empire, but they had already escaped. I think they only had one, yeah. they hung one of right. them kind of, Here's your token execution to, to appease sure. the masses or whatever. But all the sure. main guys, the top guys, Talat Pasha had escaped mm -hmm. and was negotiating to return to power. He was literally meeting with diplomats and world leaders, knowing that the dust would settle and that he could return to his home in Turkey. Right. And I'm convinced that if he didn't come into contact with Solomon Talirian, instead of the Turks, uh, uh, knowing or, or uh, essentially worshiping their founding father, Ataturk, it would have mm -hmm. been the founding father, Talat Pasha. And that's that, fascinating. That's like he was Idea. in that position, the ultimate position sure. of power. He was being harbored by his allies, the Germans, and negotiating and waiting for the dust to settle to return to power. And mm. so uh, Sogolman gets connected with this group of Armenians who were, uh, they were funded by mostly American Armenians um, mm -hmm. and, 
It was a, the largest political faction that remained of the of the the now struggling Armenian uh, community, the, the Ar Armenian state, the uh, Ar Armenian Revolutionary Federation recruited some assassins and so Sogolman got connected with them yeah. and they gave him the number one name on the list. They're like, you're, you're going to, uh, we're going to insert you into Berlin. We've, we're, we've yeah. narrowed down where Talat is. We found him and uh, he succeeded. Mm. He, he, let, me, let me show his picture. I know it's, you know, there's a better way to do this, but this is so Sohomon Tahlerian, the guy that we're talking about. And uh, anyway, we'll, we'll, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, I mean, what happened was he was, was visited by his mother, the ghost of his mother, mm. multiple times. And when I first came to this story, uh, I came to the court trial because he, he, he assassinated Talat in a, on, on a Berlin street, like, you know, in the middle of the day. It was like 11 o'clock in, in the morning. And Talat was out about his daily walk. And Sogman walked up to him, made eye contact. He came at him, straight at him, made eye contact. And, and literally, as he was passing, Talat turned just slightly, shifted just slightly. Mm -hmm. By that time, Sogman had a gun right up to the back mm -hmm. of his head, like pulled mm -hmm. the trigger immediately, right, right, right mm -hmm. here. And, and basically, uh, the way the autopsy report, which I've seen and had translated mm -hmm. for me with a, with a Turkish mm -hmm. historian, in mm. Berlin, the autopsy report says his brain exploded. You know, it's like the bullet did come out, but the, the brain, because of the angle and the pressure, the, the, his brain exploded and he fell face down. So Sobel mm. was not just there to get vengeance. He was there to get justice. So yeah. if, he had, if he had escaped or had been killed by an angry mob, he, he, would, have been yeah. a footnote, he would have been a footnote in history, this Armenian sure. terrorist, just took out, you know, this Turkish, former Turkish leader. But right. his job was to get the word, get the truth out. So he dropped his gun and and he, he was attacked mm. by a mob. And then the police rescued him from the mob. And then he was put on trial. And at mm. the trial, Talat was put on trial because all the witness testimony of the right. Armenian genocide, the witnesses came in. And the jury starts realizing for the first time yeah. what had happened and then he was acquitted he was he was like after they heard it was a short trial it was an embarrassing yeah. trial for germany they'd been harboring this this the head of the, sure. the it's basically been harboring a precursor to hitler yeah. and letting him live freely and this armenian kid found him and shot him and killed him and now he's on trial in their courtroom and the jurors were just average Germans going about their business, a plumber, a right. lawyer, a bookkeeper or whatever. And they hear this, this story and can't believe that it happened. And they acquitted him and he walked away a free man and he wrote it. He wrote his memoir. And so mm. uh, to sum up, I have the rights mm. to the memoir. It's almost, it's being, it's just finished translating and we're going to, uh, mm. publish. and we're publishing next year. And next year is the 100 year anniversary of the assassination and the trial. So the timing oh. of this is like, oh, I just came to, this, I came to this story three years ago and it's like, how come I never heard this? How come I didn't know this? And uh, the family gave me the rights. They sign up, they, they say, you know, only you, you have final say because you, you are doing this story the right way. You're telling mm. the story from Sogelman's point of view, from the memoir. Right. And the timing of it is like, oh, it's going to be published for the first time in English. This incredible story has never been told in English. It hasn't been told at all if it hasn't been told in English. Well, so, no, I mean, I, I was gonna say not a lot of people know about it. Now we know a lot about the Holocaust. We know a lot about, you know, there's movies made about, you know, the, the you know, I, we were talking earlier and I was, we were talking about the Munich massacres in 1972 of the Israeli Olympic team. And basically the Israeli government's like, we're gonna we're gonna start Operation Wrath of God, and we're gonna find these people and, and take them out, the ones that did this, and they hunted them down, and they took them out. And I'm thinking about the Nuremberg trials and how the Nazis that were you know they were put on trial for their crimes. And in fact, you know, I just remember a couple of years ago they just found another Nazi uh, that's in his 90s, and they sent him back for trial. Uh, you know, so I mean, th this is this was a, a, a there was justice that was taking part. It wasn't just a renegade rogue person, and and in fact, um, that probably from 
what Soho Moan did um, and having these testimonies come from trial, it was probably the first public time in the West that that was presented. Is that correct in how you would view it? That's exactly it. Like the first, the first reports of what was happening in the genocide were coming from uh, like missionaries in right. the interior of the Ottoman Empire, missionaries and uh, like Red Cross workers. And that would that would get back and, and anybody who paid attention to that were, were hearing about it, but that wasn't front page news. That wasn't like, uh, so Talat or uh, Solomon doing this, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. fact, you mentioned the Nuremberg trials, Solomon's trial itself is the counterpart to the Nuremberg trials. It's the only counterpart there was because these guys were never brought before a, a, a court, yeah. you know, and, right. and so, you know, fortunately international law had advanced to the point that right. during World War II, you could have a Nuremberg trial and the world would understand what was going on. Yeah. But Sokolman was, his trial was the only one and his trial was like, I don't know if, uh, I go on tangents, but this is critical. Mm -hmm. Solomon's trial is why we have the word genocide today, right? Everybody knows the word genocide, but it wouldn't have come to pass if mm -hmm. Solomon didn't go on trial and be acquitted because that acquittal got the attention of a guy named Raphael Lemkin. Raphael oh, yeah. Lemkin was a, a young uh, law student, a Polish law student who was paying attention to the, the, the court proceedings are in, in Germany, et cetera. And this trial got his attention. And he said, yeah, that was the right verdict, but it never should have come to that. The international community needs a structure to hold these kind of villains accountable and it doesn't exist. So this guy took it upon himself to bring about justice. We've got to, we've got to do that. So for the rest of, yeah. of uh, Lemkin's life, he was, arguing we've got to deal with this we we need to recognize this for what it is we and and then when he saw it happen again in his own family like Solomon's family was massacred Raphael Lemkin's own family was massacred in the the next genocide like Adolf Hitler's genocide he was literally copying what the Ottomans did I mean there's documentation for all of this Hitler literally copied and replicated the success of the yes. Armenian genocide and said well we can do it again and when Raphael Lemkin saw it happening again, and he said, we've got to coin a term. And he came up with the term genocide and, and created the Genocide Convention. And it's directly linked to Sogolman's actions. So this is a story that affects us all that nobody knows about. Wow. So. Wow. Yeah, the one thing I was going to uh, say and hear, like to hear you comment on, Michael, is this. You know, uh, right now, uh, there has been rhetoric on the Turkish side and the Azeri side, that they want to wipe out men, women, and child uh, of the Armenians. And, uh, you know, obviously the, the top leaders are not so direct in saying that, except for maybe Tayyip Erdogan. Maybe he's, seems like that's what he said when I listened to him speak. Uh, but uh, but it, it's said by some other people, but I know the sentiment is there. And I, you know, I, you know, the, in the Holocaust Museum in, in Israel and other places you go where there's these memorials, they always have the phrase never again, never again. And if anybody's watching this, uh, I, they just need to know the responsibility they have. It really does mean never again. We do have a responsibility to speak out. That's why we've been saying that the Republic of Artsakh needs to be recognized officially by our government and also the Armenian genocide needs to be recognized by the president of the United States, whether that's gonna be Trump or Biden, whoever that is, that needs to happen. I know, I think the Senate's uh, recognized it. I think maybe the House is, if I understand all that correctly. Yeah. But I think that the, rec the, the, the recognition of, of these uh, by countries that this happened guys, and we need, to not see this happening and we need to do something, this is one of the ways uh, that will start the ball rolling. And then maybe, maybe there will be com uh, compensation by the Turkish side. If the entire world says you guys committed the genocide, you've done this, look, this is what Germany did to compensate for the Holocaust, now it's your turn. And that pressure would be there. Anyway, that's just a, a side note, but it's important because I, I like action. History is important, but it's important that we 
hear it to do something with it. So right, and and you know we can wrap up with this and and, yes. and maybe continue with this yep. conversation next time. But with this, your points about, I mean that's the whole reason I'm doing this. I have two two channels. I yeah. have Tales of Truth YouTube channel. Go and subscribe. But first, subscribe here. <laughs> we we got to do that, right? We got to always say subscribe. If you are uh, watching this and you have not subscribed to, to Jacob's channel subscribe to that. Then go to my channel because we're going to continue this conversation on my other channels, but we're going to wrap this up here. But the point I want to make is that cliche, those who don't learn history are doomed to repeat it. Right. We all know that phrase history repeats. And when I started researching this, it was right at a time in my life when I started realizing history is actually one of the most important things for us to know. Right. You go to school, you learn English, you learn math, you learn, you know, PE or whatever. And, you know, our kids and we you know, go and figure out what we want to do. But it, it, it should be uh, like the his, history is whether you're a Christian or not. Mm -hmm. History is, is a study of what's happening, what God is doing. Right. The facts of history are God is involved and something's happening. And if you don't pay attention, you're blindsided when it happens again. That's what that cliche, that, that phrase is. If you don't learn history, you're, you're doomed to repeat it. Well, yeah. it's, it's like you say, it's not just knowing the facts of history. That's step one. And yeah. everybody's failed at that. So start with history. And my Tales of Truth channel is this history. And I've got mm -hmm. interviews with experts like, you know, professors from universities and Harvard psychologists and, and you know, more interviews coming up. If you want to learn this history, Tales of Truth is a good place to get started. There's, there's short videos, there's long videos, but then on my other channel, it's, uh, it's Sovereign Artsakh. And so you can learn the history on Tales of Truth, but Sovereign Artsakh is my action channel where specifically to Christians, because we're, we're in the majority on the planet, right? As, as far as world religions, most of the people on the planet are on the Christian side. Uh, as I mean, not not the majority of the population, but as far as any world religion, they're they're we're, we're number one. Then there's Islam, and then there's Hindu. So there are more Christians. We need to spread the word and act. Learn your history and figure out what you need to do. Whether it's contacting your senators or your representatives, or by the reason I've come to talk to to Jacob and reaching out to others is we need to on on this kind of like social media, we need to spread the word and bind together and, and cause a groundswell. The church needs to wake up. Don't fall asleep in the comfort of your luxury in the United States of America because it can be taken away like that. Like Sogamon's whole world was gone. He didn't live in a, a hut. It's not some primitive, you know, they lived in buildings just, I'm in a building right now that was built before the Armenian genocide, this building I'm in. It's not that long ago your whole culture can be wiped out like that if the wrong people are in charge. So yeah. wake up. All right. I can babble on, but let's. Uh... Well, well, Michael, thank you for uh, talking about Stohomon and this history and how it's really relevant for what's going on here today and look forward to talking to you again uh, soon. So God bless you. Have a great day. You too. And everybody, there's two more parts to this interview. So go to my channels. <laughs>